Hi, everyone. So I'm officially starting. So hi, everyone. I'm Diane Hatz. Um, I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Change Food. Our mission is to build a healthier food system for people, animals, and the planet. When the pandemic started, like a lot of people, like, oh my God, like all my work shut down. And then I started a group in the East Village, New York City called East Village Neighbors. Um, Edie, wave Edie. Edie and Sarita, wave Sarita. So Edie and Sarita, um, have both were both helping me with it. And we found by the end of the summer that people were asking us to buy them food more than to like deliver, which is what we were doing. So we ended up starting the fridge. Edie is the owner of Smack, her and her husband, Caesar. So our fridge is located outside of there. And um, Edie and Sarita basically are the main, the main people now. It's Sarita, it's Sarita, Sarita owns Smack, not Edie. I'm sorry, <laughs> now I, I said that and then I'm like, wait, I think that came out wrong. Cause Caesar's I'm not my husband. <laughs> I'm okay. scared of Sarita. <laughs> Sarita Caesar is still your husband. <laughs> okay, so snack. I'll share him. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, my people are the problem here. No, kidding, kidding. Um. So anyway, I told you like do raised hands. I think the, to start, why don't we say just say hi, who you are, the name of your fridge, and where you're located. If you have any, any any other burning thing you want to say, just maybe say it quickly because we have a lot of questions and issues to go through. If there's something you want us to talk about, you think we're not getting to, pop it in the chat and I'll add it to the list. So Leah, I'll call your name. Yes. I thought that'll be easier. So unmute yourself because you're you're almost all of you are on mute. So Leah. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah and I uh, help run the I run the Chelsea Fridge. Um, which opened in September, November, 2020. Um, and currently it's out of commission. So if you are going to drop off food, not refrigerated, go to the East Village Fridge instead. Thank you. Thank you, Erica Hansen. Hi, I'm Erica Hansen. I um, am a member of the Memphis Mid-South DSA and we are starting a hopefully small network of community fridges in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, currently we're actually gonna move the structure out in front of my house for our first fridge this weekend. So um, not exactly experienced, but happy to be here. Congratulations, Erin, Erin Namol. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin, I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I am uh, helping to run the Lafayette Community Fridge. We started our fridge, I think right before 2021, maybe in December of 2020, roughly. Um, we are looking to start a new one. We had someone reach out about a location. So yeah, we're, we're getting them going over here. Fantastic. Edie Meyer. Hi, um, I'm Edie. I, uh, helped Diane found East Village Neighbors, um, and then the, our fridge last October. Um, and, um, a little worried about getting through the summer, so would love to discuss things like, um, you know, fridges breaking down and volunteers going away and all those kinds of things would be very helpful. It's on the list, thank you. Amanda Block. Did we lose Amanda? Hi, I apologize, I'm rejoining. I just need to pick up my daughter from school and now I am here. I am the founder of Grace Outreach in Summit. We have had a community fridge since 2018, uh, but during COVID we shut down in favor of a pantry uh, because our community fridge is in a community center that is now used for vaccinations. So um, our pantry serves anywhere from 450 to 525 households every week. Uh, we focus mostly on fresh nutrient dense food and pair that um, with stabilizing services. But as soon as we can get back to our fridge in that location is the plan. Fantastic, uh, Amanda. Uh, Emily, Emily-Lynn. Hello. I'm Emily. Um, I am the founder of the Lynn Community Fridge in Massachusetts. So that's about 20 minutes from Somerville, um, just to get our whereabouts. Um, and we just went live on Tuesday. So we are super excited. And so I'm here to just listen to everyone and get some tips and tricks for running this summer. So okay. thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Todd Kaplan. 
Hi, I'm Todd Kaplan. I live in Somerville, Massachusetts, and um, I have been involved in the uh, Somerville Fridge, which is in Union Square, if you know our area, um, for about six months. And we are about to get two more fridges, and we have a bunch of pantries in the area. So we're all trying to coordinate. We're actually a very good um, network where we're sharing resources. So if something gets dumped, where it was, it's such a density of fridges, like there's probably, I don't know, 15 within five to 10 square miles. So if somebody gets uh, dumped on a lot of uh, produce or things that are gonna need to be distributed quickly, we just um, mobilize pretty quickly and get things distributed. Okay. Um, and uh, we're <laughs> worried about being overwhelmed by the demand because we can't hardly keep up with one fridge. Now we're gonna have three. Great, thanks, Todd. Sarita? Hi, all. I am Sarita. I own Smack, which is a restaurant in the East Village of Manhattan. And that is where the East Village uh, Neighbors Fridge is located in Pantry. So uh, I'm with Diane and Edie. And looking forward to chatting with all of you and knocking our heads together, sharing ideas. Thanks, Sarita. Rachel Crowder? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rachel. I live in the Upper West Side of Manhattan and I'm a volunteer with the West End Fridge and the Community 120th Street Fridge in Harlem. Uh, I've been an active volunteer since about January and looking forward to learning from everybody else here. Great, thanks a lot. Megan Costello. <laughs> Megan. Megan, you're cracking up. Do maybe speak closer. No. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe just fix your headphones or okay, Nicole Wu. You're on mute. Unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, I work with Leah at the Chelsea Fridge. I volunteer there. Fantastic. Great Thank to you. Meet everybody. <laughs> Frank Gonzalez, do you want to say hi? Yes. Hi, guys. Sorry, Frank Gonzalez. Um, new community refrigerator coming on June 15th called Lowy Sida Community Refrigerator. Uh, uh, founder of Lowy Sida Realty and a bunch of other organizations. Thanks for having me. Excited to to learn and listen about the other community refrigerators. Fantastic, thank you. Emily Waters. Hi, um, I, uh, with a group of friends, we started KWT Free Fridge in Kensington, Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn. We started it um, in, Gen well, we started it in March and um, we have been pretty good about getting food from um, pantries, but, we, we no longer have that route. So we're trying to figure out how to get more food because as soon as we fill it up, it's gone. It's gone within an hour. It's and on the there is such a need. Yeah. Pardon me? It's on our list of things. I, Cause a lot of people, we have the same issues. So yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Alexandria Julius. Hi, I'm in New York city and with Trudy who's also on the call, um, we're trying to start a fridge in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. Fantastic. Kelsey Sheridan. Hi, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and work uh, with community gardens, urban gardening, donation gardens. Um, do not run a community fridge, but I'm interested in learning more and hearing some stories. Fantastic. Jennifer Hall. Hi, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I volunteer with PDX Free Fridge. I think, um, I was just looking on our map, I think we have over 30 fridges and pantries around the Portland area, and then there are some more in the um, neighboring um, communities. So I'm here just to, to listen. I think the first free fridge maybe started in this area last summer, late summer. Um, so there's a, a pretty good network of people. Fantastic, thank you. Dan Zalderer. Hey everybody, I'm the, uh, the co-founder of the Mod Haven Community Fridge. Um, 
nice to meet everybody. Really happy to be on this call. It's exciting to see that people coming together to think about how to scale this work and to make it more sustainable. So couldn't be happier to jump in. I'm going to have to run and teach a class pretty soon, but I wanted to at least pop in and thank you all for the work that you're doing and excited to work in partnership as we move forward and think about how to grow this nationally and even internationally. Great. I also, just for anyone who came in um, after I mentioned it, we're recording this. So Dan, if you have to leave early, I'll be sending the link to all of you. So you can- Oh, great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, forgive me already. Sharufi, the leading. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharufi. I'm, I'm one of the people working on setting up the house Kitchen Fridge along with Alex. And so, um, yeah, we're, I live in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood and really excited to learn from you all on best practices and what makes a successful fridge. Fantastic. Thank you. Lorraine's iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi. Um, I'm part of the KWT. I live in Brooklyn, Kensington, and I'm part of the KWT team. And I'm here to listen and take in some information from you, all you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Trader. Hi. Um, I help out with the West End Fridge on 77th Street in Manhattan, but I also do, do a lot of the pickups and drop offs. Of, many of the other upper Manhattan and Bronx bridges. Fantastic. Megan, do you want to try again? Megan Costello? You're on mute. Megan, unmute yourself. Okay. Is it better now? Okay, great. Um, I'm Megan. I'm in Brooklyn. I'm a member of the Gowanus Community Fridge team. We operate two fridges. And we work with different community organizations like Guadis Mutual Aid and a local food pantry, a few different local food pantries. And we've been in operation for about a year. I'm not one of the main organizers, but I've been a member of the team for the past year. So I'm interested to hear from everybody else. Great. So I just, there was just a comment that um, there's 60 people on the call and we're moving a little slow. So maybe we could just put it. So just say hi, your fridge in your city. And then we can get into further, like deeper discussions. And I apologize. Um, we're worried we're going to run out of time. So Justice McCray. Hi, yes. Um, I'm Justice, uh, Beacon Community Fridge in Beacon, New York. Um. Great. Thank you. Troy said uh, she can't speak, but she has noted in the chat. Uh, Emily Ursic. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm an intern with the Two Week Rescue Commission, and we don't have a fridge. We're just really interested in about learning about it. So, great. And then Heather McLean said she's in a library and she can't talk, but she said hello to everybody. Aisha Hallman. I think we just lost her. Oh, I don't hear you. You're on. I can't. We can't hear you. Sorry. Is your, is your computer on mute? I'll come back, I'll come back. Okay, wait, Bailey. Hi, we're uh, starting the first free fridge in Vancouver, Washington, I'm Bailey. Yay, Tracy B. Hi, I'm a volunteer with the East Village and Chelsea Community Fridges in um, New York City. And I'm also helping get the Low East Side uh, fridge started. Great. Megan, Russell? Yep. Hi, I'm uh, one of the organizers of the Newton Community Fridge Collaborative in Newton, Massachusetts, just uh, west of Boston. Great. Kelly Ernst Friedman? Yeah, hi. Kelly Ernst Friedman with City Slicker Farms in Oakland, California. Yay, I was at City Slicker Farms in 2007. Glad to see you guys are still thriving. Oh, wow, that's amazing. I'd love to talk to you offline later. Definitely. Uh, Maddie Price? Hi, I'm with Seattle Community Fridge. I just popped uh, some info uh, about us in the chat. Um, we'll only be um, semi-engaged uh, with today, but um, yeah, happy to connect. Uh, feel free to reach out to us through Facebook or Instagram. Great, thanks for being here. Chelsea P? Hi, my name is Chelsea, and I am a volunteer for the upcoming uh, Vancouver Free Fridge in Vancouver, Washington. Fantastic. Uh, P.A. Thomas? Yeah, just listening. Thanks. Want to learn. Okay. Sure. Ethan Gallegos. Sorry. 
Hi, I'm Ethan. I'm from Vancouver, Washington. I work on the WSUB Food System Action Research Project, and I'm just here to learn as well. Thanks. Fantastic. Marce Marce Maricel Cardenas? Hi, I'm from Stop Waste in um, Alameda County, California, and just here to listen. Thanks so much. Great. We have some grantees that work in food fridges, so super interested. Thanks. Thanks. Jenny Roslindale? Hi, my name is Jenny. I work on the Rosno Community Fridge located in Rosno, Massachusetts, and I'm just here to learn and listen. Great. Eliza Jacobson? Hi, um, I'm just here listening. Um, I work at Essex Market um, on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, um, and we're also working on putting uh, up a fridge outside of the market. Fantastic. Ariadne, I'm sorry, Eridan, uh, Eridana. Eridana. It's okay. It's so sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Ariadna Phillips, South Bronx Mutual Aid. Uh, we have four community fridges in the Bronx, uh, Anchor Fridge, Isla Fridge, Nuestra Nevera and People's Pantry, and we serve the wider Uptown and Bronx uh, community fridge networks, along with other work with mutual aids. Very Thanks. nice to see some familiar faces. Thanks for joining. And Eve V? Okay, I'll come back. Catalina Lope, Lopez, I just see Lope. Okay, Kaz M. Gordon. Hi, I'm Kaz. I'm with the Sugar Hill Community Fridge, but I also work in tandem with a lot of um, uptown Manhattan fridges. That's it. Fantastic. Mike Z. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm uh, with the Dorchester Community Fridge out of Boston, Mass. Fantastic. Carlos? Hello, I'm Carlos. I don't work with any fridge in particular. I just volunteer with a couple of fridges in the South Bronx, excluding anything associated with the Mount Haven Network. Fantastic. Uh, Lee, Mike, Lee, Michelle, do you want to say hello? And then Marion Mitchell. Okay, did I miss anybody? If not, if I did, just just unmute and say hi. Okay. Hi. Hi. Who'd I miss? I'm sorry, Celeste, I'm sorry I missed you. Oh, that's okay. I don't have a community fridge yet. We are creating one at the moment. Um, so I'm mostly here just to learn. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, first topic I thought we could talk about is how you source food for the fridge. So do you have people in the community dropping off? Um, if, you're in, if you're in New York City, do you use our food NYC? Do you have volunteers picking up? Like, how are you doing it? Are you having issues? You know, how are you sourcing? Are you thinking about how to get, keep food in the fridge constantly, which is a huge problem? Uh, Amanda, do you want to start? Gladly. So uh, I recognize that we're a little bit different in that we have a pantry um, connected to this, but we, um, we source food in a few different ways. We're connected to the Summit Farmers Market where there's a table called the gift table, give it fresh today, which is how we started our fridge where it was only sourced uh, from donations, either through farm vendors or monetary donations um, given to the table, which were then spent to the farm vendors, or uh, if people had gardens and had an abundance through that and it was donated to that table. Uh, we then um, developed a relationship with our local food bank. And then we developed a relationship with a farmer's market type store and um, we ended up developing such a tight relationship with them that he considered us as part of his store. We pay him, of course, but we get better than wholesale prices because he goes to Hunts Point on our behalf and makes purchases for us. So do you find that having a food table at the farmer's market is more effective than just having people drop food off at the fridge? Yes, uh, for a few reasons. People, if people are already at the farmer's market, it doesn't necessarily, um, it, it, people have that kind of, you know, they're, they're already there to buy. They either make a selection that they think people would like, or they're just, they're, they, it's no big deal, quite, quite usually. And yes, I do live in a very affluent area, 
um, but that still experiences a high rate of food insecurity uh, where people will just donate because they know that that money is going to go back to the vendors that they've already shopped with. Okay, fantastic. And Justice, use your hand up. Are you there? Uh, Rachel? Yeah, hi. Um, in my experience, uh, some of the ways that we've been sourcing food has been uh, through volunteers and through um, just talking with local organizations about what food they can give away at the end of the day. I did have a conversation with uh, one of our organizers, Atlantis, and um, she couldn't be here today, but encourages uh, people to reach out uh, because she had heard that um, in New York City specifically, there's been concerns, I'm sure this will come up as a later topic, around the cleanliness of, of the fridges and that the Department of Sanitation here is going to be discouraging bigger organizations from donating to the fridge unless they're a nonprofit because if they're not a nonprofit, they're not protected by the Good Samaritan laws. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron? Um, so what you had just said, um, oh, I'll go back to that. So sourcing, um, we are having volunteers, uh, pick up, we're encouraging them to pick up extra things when they're doing grocery runs. And we've set up a local restaurant who is also accepting donations on our behalf. If someone doesn't want to drive all the way out to the fridge, but um, we are about to start reaching out to some local restaurants and I love the farmer's market idea, but even right now, I feel like we're having some trouble with uh, community engagement and getting people to realize that it is as simple as like just grabbing a little something extra. So stuff to bridge that gap would be really helpful. Okay, great, Leah. Um, so we're in Chelsea, which is a very restaurant heavy neighborhood. Um, and we mostly get our food from restaurants. Um, which I think also works because our volunteers, like the vast majority don't have cars. So anything that can be just like walked over is ideal. Um, and then the few that do have cars kind of do the bigger pickups for like groceries or um, like from the other distribution sites. And I know in New York City, there's like tons of distribution sites that have pickups, but you know, since we're in Manhattan, we kind of don't really get to the, uh, those pickups in time since they're mostly like outer boroughs. Um, so we're we're working on building like the relationships between uh, all the businesses in our area because we just think it'd be good um, for, for a better community. Great, Erica. Um, there's another organization in our area here that already has a fridge up. And um, just because no one's mentioned this, we have found like a lot of people have been utilizing the fridge through the local Buy Nothing Facebook group. People have been both donating and then also receiving, like finding out about the free fridge through the Buy Nothing group. So that um, I think has been a big success for them. I am not affiliated with them, but I thought that was a really good idea if there's like a active. So are you saying you go, that they go on to the Buy Nothing group and ask for donations to the fridge? We have, yes. So we have like a really active like Midtown, Downtown Memphis Buy Nothing group that has like 5,000 people and a lot of posts um, and it's moderated, but people will either go on there and be like, ISO food, like I'm hungry, I didn't get my food stamps. And then people will comment and be like, oh, the fridge is located here, here. And other people will be like, I have all this extra food from like the school has been giving out free food to all students. You can get a free pickup if you have any kids of school age and then people have extra they don't want. And so also, that has been like how they found out either to give food directly to other people or bring it to the fridge and pantry that um, the other group has established already. That's fantastic. Todd? Thank you. So um, I, maybe if other people in Massachusetts or elsewhere uh, know more about this, but uh, at the farmer's market, at least other places are setting up tables with the farmer's market permission and getting like what would they call two plus one, meaning someone will buy two things and then the, the actual vendors will ask them, do you want to um, purchase something for the community fridge? And so it's collected right there. And also it's a really good way I, uh, of engaging with people and you know, telling them about the fridge and its availability, but also that they may want to um, contribute or help on a regular basis. So it's kind of an out outreach vehicle as well. Um, so we, I've not started that yet in Somerville. We're, we're just on the edge of starting it, but it's kind of good timing because the farmer's markets here are just 
kind of in their initial stages. We're very seasonal here. Great, thank you. Jennifer, Paul. Um, so just as a worker, a worker bee in there, I don't organize the, the food things, but I, I am on the app next door, which I know a lot of people despise, but that's also been a really great way to communicate just in the same way as the Facebook buy nothing. Somebody will come on saying that they don't have any food and all kinds of community members post things. Um, probably four of us posted about PDX free fridges. Um, and also when people are offering food, like they have the excess food boxes, the USDA ones, people post them on there. I've picked up a number from people offering that or connected them to the free fridges. And then I think it just starts to spread the word in that way. Um, but I know that since we're mutual aid, I don't know if there's a particular leader of the group, but there is a member that works in logistics with a, a, a major local grocery store. And she, I don't know how she did it, but she has a lot of connections and she'll get um, calls for um, donations of pallets of food. And then she'll send out a message on Slack to ask, asking for people to come and transport and distribute the food. So we get a lot of our food that way. Um, donations, monetary donations made. So there are weekly orders um, made to a grocery store. And again, people to pick up and distribute. And, and I think also stores that just donate um, on a biweekly basis, as, you know, excess food, so. Great, thanks. Um, Nicole, after Nicole, there's like a, there's a very active conversation going on in the chat. So I wanna address that, but Nicole, do you wanna make a comment? Yeah, um, I just want to mention that um, I have had some luck just kind of messaging people on Instagram, like all those like snack and breverages company, like that are smaller, like the ones like, you know, the food like you might find at like Whole Foods, like the smaller brands. So we have had some luck, like just having them like ship us some like, you know, like snacks or beverages. And um, also, I, I think um, one of the idea we might explore is maybe we can come up with like a Google Sheets of like the more like the bigger corporate that are willing to donate to mutual aid um, group like us. For example, like we currently have Panera Bread and Just Salad. Since they're national, so if they're willing to give to us, they probably would give to like all the other fridges too. So like, I don't know if we can kind of set up a good way to kind of share that information. Like, like you know, like who do you contact at um, like Whole Foods or like if you have someone like Panera Bread like we do, like then we can kind of share that information with everyone else because you know they're they're in like a lot of states. So yeah. Yeah. Oh sorry. The thing about that though is that, you know, so I I see a lot of things in the chat about people being like, are you mutual aid or are you nonprofit? And our fridge is kind of like a special one because we are mutual aid, but our host is a nonprofit. So mm -hmm. for example, Panera Bread only donates to nonprofit mm -hmm. and our host save your mission is so great like they completely let us do anything we want but we are very lucky in that if we want to sign up for something as a nonprofit, they will do it for us so that's not something that i know most fringes can do mm -hmm. and i know obviously we can talk about this later because it's a whole thing uh nonprofits versus mutual aid for sure we could have a whole other chat about that um but that's just one thing to be aware of that you know obviously some places will only donate to nonprofit, and then some will donate to whoever and then if you go under the table, you can kind of get whatever you want. So, yeah. And and for you groups that are mutual aid, um, I have put a guide together on how to start a community fridge. And it is a group that said they would be a fiscal sponsor for any fridges that want to. You could contact them because we're mutual aid ourselves, but it's running through my nonprofit, Change Food. So we're, it's, there's a, if you guys don't know, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act will cover you for any liability. But one of the questions I did have is, I don't know if it covers for like if somebody slips in front of the fridge, like has anybody thought about that or done anything about that? Or do we think that's something we should think about? And on top of that, I wanna sort of also throw in the health department, um, sanitation department. I think that was in the chat or somebody mentioned it. That's also another issue is I, I had said from the beginning and like, I feel like the health department will crack down at some point. Can I jump in on that one? This yeah, is Eddie over at South Bronx Mutual Aid. We've please. dealt with DOB, we've dealt with Department of Health. Um, so we've dealt with a couple of different interesting challenges and I would 
recommend a few things that we learned in the process. So one, just finding lawyers, finding legal groups that will represent you pro bono. We went through the Fordham Law Clinic that will represent mutual aid groups um, with their students, uh, with their law students. So they were wonderful. Brian Glick, G-L-I-C-K, and his team are amazing. Again, keep in mind, they are law students that are a part of that clinic, but they have really been helpful if groups do want to pursue the path of incorporation, whether as community fridges or mutual aids, they're amenable to talking about things like this. So just keep in mind, it's not our recommendation that anyone needs to go that route, but simply said having legal counsel around some of these things is really helpful. And you know that's one particular law clinic that has made themselves available in New York City to mutual aid related initiatives. Um, another thing I would just keep in mind is documentation of everything that's going on that you're doing in the event that there are summonses. So for example, with a department of building summons, I uh, think community fridges need to be aware of in New York City is not having a grounded outlet where their fridge is plugged in. If you have an extension cord, that could be a citation on whoever your fridge host is. So um, our host got a citation, somebody called it in. It cost a correct for us about 300 something dollars to install the grounded outlet but if you cure it within a certain period of time, then they'll dismiss the additional penalties. But you do have a limited window of time from the time that's given to the host. Um, the issue with health was, I think somebody claimed that, you know, we had to have a food permit, not if we're not selling the food. So that was something that we went and pushed back on that we just called the Department of Health back. And we're like, we're not selling anything. The health guidelines are listed here. Everything is free. Everything is labeled. This is good Samaritan work. Um, and that was it and it was dismissed. So I can't say that that's a perfect solution in every case, but just making sure you have your guidelines posted uh, around food safety, making sure it's regularly being checked and making sure that you communicate as soon as possible if those calls or citations go in, what you're doing, that this is not a restaurant, that it is not paid, um, what your sanitation protocol is. And again, with DOB, curing violations immediately um, has been one way that we've approached this. Do you run through, uh, are you a 501c3 or do you run through one? No. Nope. You're not concerned about liability because I thought you had to be working. So here's what we've done. Um, Freege, F-R-E-E-G-E, a community fridge. If they want to have the liability passed over to Freege, you can sign up with them on Freege.org. There is a form to basically assign uh, liability to them. They are a 501c3. So there's a form that you can fill out and send over to them. And then they will assume liability of your fridges. If you put, you know, each address of each community fridge. So that's one route that you can go. Um, we are incorporated, but that doesn't mean 501c3 status. So these are conversations we're having right now around what route we're going to go, um, whether to get DNO insurance, which I would say if you do incorporate and you do go the nonprofit route, having DNO insurance is a liability concern, but even just, but what is DNO? Oh, directors and officers insurance. So if there's something that your entity is sued for, the yeah. directors and officers insurance is what covers that as a liability. Again, this is an approach for nonprofits. But even just incorporating, you're putting a veil. Mind you, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give legal advice, but I can repeat some of the things we've heard is that the corporate veil is a protection for your organizers. So let's say you don't want to be a nonprofit, but you do incorporate as whatever you incorporate as. Um, a regular incorporation, uh, an LLC, et cetera, et cetera. The corporate veil is still a level of distinction from directly suing your organizers versus suing an entity that if you don't have a lot of money, I'm not saying you're judgment proof, but they can only go after what you have. So just keep that in mind that if you have no legal structuring whatsoever, you are opening up anybody who's found to be visibly organizing with your group to degrees of legal liability which could include the host, right? Which could include your organizers. So again, this doesn't constitute legal advice. I'm not trying to give legal advice. I'm just saying some of the things that we've learned in the process, which is what eventually led us to incorporation because we're also active as activists. And as a result of that, you get targeted, right? When yeah. you are active as activists speaking out against corrupt officials in your community. So I just mentioned this as, what we've learned in the process of the last year and change of operating. Well, and I just I just want to sort of stress how important this is because I think during the pandemic, I know during the pandemic, 
all legal services, the de health departments, whatever, they've really been lax because they've understood that people need to be fed and it was such a crisis. Now that we're getting back to sort of more of a normal and things are opening up, this stuff might become more of an issue. Oh, hundred um, percent. Yeah. I'm sure of it. The conversations that we're overhearing, we are sure that there will be more sanitation targeting. We're sure that there'll be more questions being asked by Department of Health. And I would say just from our experience, we think it's really meaningful for anybody, even with a mutual aid framework, to get your food handler certification, your food safety certification. And we know a few entities in New York City have become reaching out like saying, hey, the course is free. You know, we'll cover the cost of the certificate in New York City. I think it's like $24, $25. But even if that's going to be, for example, um, you know, a hurdle, there are, I think within like Donate NYC, you can also sign up to get the, the food handlers training. So I would just say, knowing food safety regulations, having somebody or people in your organizing team um, that know food safety, wherever it is that you're located is really important because it then helps you advocate in the event that you do catch the attention of whatever powers that be. Fantastic. And Celeste, did you see Alexandria answered for me? So thank you very much. Um, does anyone else want to comment on this on the legal? It, it's going to become more important. Like I agree that this is an issue that's just been put to the side and it's going to be more to the forefront. So either go through a nonprofit, become a nonprofit, incorporate. Um, but it's it, it's going to be important. And I also think, I think fridges are here to stay. Um, and I, I, I actually just want to throw out, what do you guys think the future of fridges are? Like I want to get into volunteer burnout. And Edie, I know you had mentioned this, like trying to keep volunteers. Like, do you want to start this discussion? Like, does anyone have any thoughts? I mean, Edie will start, but does anyone else have any thoughts about like where we're going, how to keep volunteer, volunteer retention, that type of thing? I mean, luckily we we lose volunteers and we gain others, so that which helps. Um, but I am a little concerned for the upcoming summer. Um, one thing we're doing um, next week is Sarita and I are throwing a volunteer appreciation event um, because our, our volunteers really haven't had a chance to meet yet. And I think the more we can uh, kind of make a cohesive group, um, they all sort of know each other through our WhatsApp group that we have that's very active. But um, I think to be able to get them to feel real ownership and real involvement as opposed to just doing their once a week thing, which most of them do. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that will help, but any other ideas are really appreciated. Yeah, does anybody else have any experience or um, advice on volunteer recruitment and keeping volunteers? Just jump in. I don't think I think we're bored. Okay. I do. I, um, I used to run the Washington Square United Methodist Church um, food program uh, on West 4th Street 18 years ago. And one godsend were different clubs at NYU that were looking for community service opportunities. And I think if you can energize some of them, um, you can get some return volunteers. Also engaging with the people who are volunteering, just developing a relationship also tends to bring people back. And I realize that's hard if people are kind of on their own doing the volunteering, but if an organizer can just even kind of maintain a, an undercurrent, it, it helps keep people. Well, how can I ask, how is everybody managing their volunteers? How are you assigning duties? Is it just like, how are you doing it? So, Signal? We have, um, we have a Slack channel and then we have like a Google form with a schedule that'll have like the month laid out and our volunteers have access to edit that document. And so they'll go sign themselves up for whatever cleaning shifts they want. And then if they need something picked up or they need to talk about something, we have a Slack channel but it is kind of hard to get people to engage in Slack sometimes. What I there? Found... Oh, no, that's okay. Have... Emily, Hi. You... Where... Okay. Where what have... has worked for me? Um, should I continue? Please, Emily, go ahead. Okay. Um, we've put out, you know, Google forms and things for people to fill out and they don't 
do it. But what I do, if I can do this, is I, I go to our fridge and our pantry and I photograph it every day. And I, I put it on Instagram and onto our, our, the mutual aid group that we are associated with. And I just say, we're hungry, you know, we need food. I'm trying to put out messages that are positive. And um, I, I've gotten a lot of messages back. I've gotten a lot of people, if I post every day, people respond to me individually direct message me if i go over to the fridge i find people talk to me and they say i i live across the street i watch and so one time my fridge was not cold the door was open someone told me they called me up you know like so i find people respond almost if they, they don't want to sign up but they want to be able to connect somehow does i don't know if anyone else has that experience People will write to me and they say, we have like 25 chickens. Can we put them in the fridge? I'll say yes, but it's sporadic. It's not something that I can depend on. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And Mike Z, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry uh, about that. We use uh, Slack as well as Google Sheets. Um, and we've found that it's moderately successful. Um, we try to have events weekly with volunteers to keep them engaged, uh, but there is uh, volunteer burnout among, I would say the five to 10 people who are actively involved. Um, so trying to work around that has been uh, challenging for us. Yeah, I think we have the same. Lee? Hi there. Um, sorry, I've been in and out cars and trains, and but I've been listening. Um, I started a project called Moms Feed the Bronx, and I, I also was concerned about volunteer burnout. Has anyone, and I'm sorry if you mentioned it, talked about a volunteer wage to provide people? Because I know that with some of our fridges in the Bronx, we've been able to um, give um, a small amount of money for delivery drivers and for people that are going to clean and really make sense. Is anyone else doing that? We'd wanted to, I mean, I don't know if Sreed or Edie, you want to talk about that at all yourselves, but we'd wanted to, and then I don't remember why we did, we didn't have enough. Like we were afraid we wouldn't get enough donations. Go ahead, yeah, we, yeah I, we did. We discussed that. We did like the idea. I mean, we, we, we tossed it around and then um, our demand at the fridge is so high. We, you know, literally our fridge, if it's filled every hour, it's emptied within pretty much an hour to an hour and a half. So uh, we decided to use our money towards food. That's what we came down to, down to Diane. That's what was the chat is that we were going to use our money towards purchasing groceries uh, more at a wholesale cost just to get more fresh foods in the fridge. Uh, and we do have a pretty robust volunteer list, but we are starting to worry, you know, come summer vacations, uh, people who haven't been working, picking up extra shifts or maybe going back to work now, those kinds of things are, I think, more on the horizon for us. But uh, we did discuss it. It just, we didn't, I guess, have to do it at the time, but we may, it may be something that we need to look at going forward. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would just it does that, make a difference with consistency and having people show up. And, and again, it hasn't been a lot of money, but it's, um, you know, and it's it's something that I think is um, important to acknowledge people for all their their um, help, too. So but I, I again, I know there's only a limited out, amount of money and it's food and it's, you know, and how do you spread it across everything? But it is something that we've noticed does help even a small amount. And you don't, there are no, um, is it, is it cash in hand or is it like tax implications? Like I'm being anal here, like it's a business, but is it like a tip? Um, oh gosh. Sorry. My AirPods just died on me too. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I have not handed out the cash um, to, to anyone, but I, but I believe that that's what happens. Okay. But I, I, you know, don't, I don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay. Leo, but, yes. There. Oh yeah. So we, um, so for communication, we use WhatsApp and uh, Google calendar. Um, so basically 
like, you know, at the beginning of every month, I'll be like, this is what's available for the month. Who wants it? It's really first come first serve. And then, and then like, as like dates come closer, I'll just like remind everyone, like fill in the gaps. And then last resort is I go to Instagram. Um, so we have like, the thing is we have like 44 pickups a week and then there's like 66 volunteers. I would say only half of the volunteers do stuff. <laughs> um, I haven't even like heard from some of the volunteers. I'm kind of like, are you, what are you doing in the group? Um, but yeah, I think with the summer and like things opening up is where, you know, like for example, like Friday nights and Saturday nights a couple months ago, so many volunteers would do those. Like those would be covered for months. And now it's like, obviously no one wants to do them. Like, I don't even want to do them. I did one last week and I was like, I don't think I'm, I'd like to have my life too, you know? Um, so yeah, and I know, I obviously I know that volunteer burnout for sure. And it's also like, you know, the world is opening up. Of course, of course you want to go out and do stuff that's for yourself too. So it is, it is like a weird kind of balance too, because I, you know, I'd, I'd rather take on a volunteer that I can get to know and that our group can get to know and like be more of a team rather than like random people. But now, now I'm starting to pick up like, random people that aren't actually in our group because I'm like I just want it covered I just want the food picked up because I don't want to miss any of the food pickups because I want the relationship with the business to stay like okay they're consistent like we can count on them and so it's not like a wishy-washy thing so I'm trying to figure that out too now just how to how to keep people engaged and I haven't thought about like paying anyone mainly because you know the same reason like we 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 got a lot of donations over like the holidays and then we haven't really gotten a lot since then and we mostly use our money for um like like repackaging like for example we pick up like 200 bagels a day so a lot of our money goes into kind of like packaging things so that everything stays sanitary for everyone great thanks leah um ariadna do you want to pop in sure sorry i it's just a lot because so that's why i raised my hand uh, we're just going to mention with volunteers we do coordinate on signal we do a lot of recruitment through social media, but as was mentioned, also just in person at the fridges because we'll do mass distributions, um, you know, throughout the Bronx and sometimes over Manhattan. So a lot of people meet us that way. And then we can refer people in that area to those fridges because we distribute not just to our fridges, but to the fridges in the network in the Bronx and upper Manhattan. So we'll refer people to their nearest fridge when we're stocking it um, or obviously when we're at ours in person because we'll hang out sometimes for a couple hours and distribute. Um, just a note about money. Uh, we would urge personal experience for just to be vigilant of groups utilizing your work, your likeness, photographs, et cetera, to fundraise to their names, whether it is, and I don't mean like a nonprofit that you're closely aligned with. I mean, like people that you never gave permi permission to. So we already had this issue come up in the Bronx where one particular fridge I named in the chat, Mount Haven Fridge was doing that. They were using the likeness of many other fridges to fundraise to themselves without the, cons the consent of any of those organizers. So we would just say, be very mindful, pay attention to what's going on because we've seen that like other groups recruiting volunteers without paying attention to what your guidelines and sometimes putting food into your fridges, it's not permitted per your own fridge guidelines. Like fridges, for example, that might not accept meat and dairy. Yeah, I'd also just wanna just let everyone know if you have a Venmo, Venmo account, just be careful. We had some weird thing and Somebody had East Village Neighbors Venmo account, but it was going somewhere else. And I don't know, it was weird. It took weeks and weeks for me to sort it out. But Megan, Russell, did you want to pop in? Oh, yeah. Can I just, just say something quickly about Venmo? It's not meant to be used for business expenses. So if you do pay people with Venmo or anything, um, don't write a lot in the description. Try to keep it to just thank you or good times or whatever. It should be labeled as something personal. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for that. Oh, no worries. I just wanted to speak about the volunteers. So when we set up our um, fridge, we set it up with um, partnerships with uh, junior partners and senior partners within our community. And a lot of those partnerships were like a church owned this, a YMCA in our area owned this, and a junior partner was responsible then for um, uh, twice a month sort of staffing all the volunteers. So that way it didn't fall on us to find all the volunteers for all the pickups and our relationships. Senior partners do it once a week. So it might be a temple in our area and they have a lot of volunteers at their temple that do all of the pickups and drop-offs for that day. So they own the entire day and everything. And that way there's a consistency in the volunteers. We have a Facebook, a uh, closed Facebook group that we use as well. So everyone takes pictures. There's probably like, there's a ton of dialogue on it each day. And so that's where members in the community can 
individually go out and put stuff in the fridge um, or they can join one of the teams that we have, but we kind of wanted to establish a structure so we didn't have to deal with the volunteer burnout. And that way there was sort of camaraderie within the teams who were doing this. That's a great idea to get different organizations to host days. It's worked really well because that way they know that every Monday if they're picking up you know soup from Johnny's luncheonette it's the same volunteers who are going so they develop a relationship with that vendor in the community um, and we have you know they and they're responsible for three times a day within whatever window they want to but they have a, we have morning pickups afternoon pickups and evening pickups scheduled and so each team for that day and they're responsible for the social media for that day as well so that way they kind of own it soup to nuts and that's not to say that other individuals in our Newton community community can't go out and also do stuff but we have um, a lot of volunteers we've like waiting lists to get on teams right now and it's worked really well because at the end of the day we didn't want to always have to be the ones you know in control and that way if the team captains have issues then they kind of come to us but we kind of communicate with there's three of us who are organizers and we communicate with the team captains and we do regular communication with them and then they push that all down to their team and we post all the guidelines as well on our uh, on our facebook page which is really robust and has a ton of people and pictures speak a million words and so each time a picture is posted and it's the same thing you guys all say you know we fill the fridge it's totally full 30 minutes later it's all gone so we post a picture and someone's there to kind of fill it right away. But the structure has worked incredibly well for managing the volunteers. That's really great. Um, Emily? Megan? Yeah. <laughs> Megan, um, yeah. can, you, can you teach us how to do this? Can you run a, a, a workshop? Can I contact you? This sounds you really, can. really good. I'm going to really need I, I, this. I'll put, and I'll, I'll say as well, we are, so we're not mutual aid. Um, so we started this, um, I'm actually on the board of uh, a food pantry in Newton, and this was a offshoot idea we had. It's not a Newton food pantry initiative. We started it uh, and kind of gave it roots and, but it's owned by the community, but we're, we don't consider ourselves mutual aid just to throw that out there. And, and, and from a liability perspective, we did at the Newton food pantry, we did put um, our location and host under our Newton Food Pantry, which is a 501c3 uh, policy uh, from a, a general liability, and we have the DNO insurance and everything. So we are covered and operate a little bit differently from a legal perspective, but from a team perspective, we're totally separate. And I'm happy to connect and share information with anyone on that because it makes it a little more sustainable. And so, you know, if someone goes away, you just within the team, they can kind of manage that. And I'm going to type my email in the chat right now. Okay, so moving on, somebody mentioned fridges are the heat. How do you handle? So let's, why don't we throw in, um, someone had a question about structures for the fridges, what you guys do and how you do it, and then fridges in the heat. And Emily, I'm sorry, I see you had your hand up and I didn't see it. Did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just applauding. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, but how, how does, how do you guys, I know we're just coming into the heat of summer in most places and this might be the first hot summer like heated time you guys have had but does anyone have any best tip practices problems what one should do etc no so sarita the thing about when caesar unplugs that's when it's really cold you unplug it yeah, you got it. So during, so uh, the way our fridge is structured is outside on the sidewalk and um, we, it's not, it's kind of freestanding the pantry. And then we've put like some vinyl tarping over it to protect it from like the elements of rain and, and snow during the winter. Uh, but during, yes, yeah, so during heavy rain and mostly very, very cold snowstormy days, that's when we unplug it just so we don't, uh, have any kind of electrical short or you know the it's it's our when it's cold it's cold you know the fridge when it's like zero <laughs> celsius 32 fahrenheit you don't you know the fridge is going to stay cold and our food moves out of there very quickly uh this will be the first summer though that we're going into because we started our fridge last october and we're trying to brainstorm ideas on how to keep the fridge cool we haven't had a breakdown yet um uh, for us, worst case scenario is that 
you know, there's, we're in the middle of New York City. People are giving free fridges away a lot, or you can get reduced price fridges. So if we have to get, you know, my husband and I are, are fine with getting the fridges and supplying those, but uh, preferably we, we don't want to do that because we also lock it down on a pallet on the ground. So it's like removing the fridge, putting a new one in, all that. But uh, we, we thought about actually, uh, it will take up room, but on the really hot days, at least putting some kind of ice baths in the inside the fridge themselves, just to keep things co cooler if the compressor is not going to be working as well. Uh, but as far as like a consistent month or so of heat, I'm not sure how, how well our fridge is going to do. Uh, I'm not anyone else. Whoever's operated throughout the summer would be great if you let us know how you did that. <laughs> Nicole just said she tried to do ice packs, but guests take the ice packs. Oh, you that's true. Everything in the fridge. You're right. right. You're right. Of course it happened. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I remember when we started, we would have these like metal, these really nice metal tins to put yes. metals in. The tins would be gone. They were gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, Erica, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I am maybe the one with the structure question. So we have one structure that's made of wood already. I'm curious in light also with like the heat question, I guess it kind of ties in. Um, I'm curious if anyone has switched from doing like with all the wood prices being insane right now. And also considering that like my group doesn't necessarily have anyone right now who has like carpentry experience. So I'm wondering if anyone has had experience with like using Rubbermaid outdoor like storage units or an alternative like mega easy construction method um, and or like the pros and cons of that or cost effective stuff with the lumber prices seem to be like really crazy and we're not able to find I haven't been able to find like any reclaimed kind of secondhand plywood or something like that for future fridges so open to suggestions anyone I know in New York there was an effort to get reclaimed wood because people tend to live off the street there's also an organization you can sign up with through Department of Sanitation that allows you to pick up free furniture. So once you get in, if you get approved, they have a site, uh, I believe in Long Island City. I apologize if the name is escaping me, but it's through the Donate NYC portal. And so they have furnishing that can include like metal furnishing. So all of the stuff that gets rescued, at least in New York City, that then you can set up an appointment to go pick up for free. And at the time we were not incorporated, we were anything, we were mutual aid. I explained what it was showed up and the person who was on site was just like, yeah, absolutely. And they let us take um, what we needed. So we've used that for pantries in addition to like fridge shelters, but I was just going to answer that question that was asked. There's a Laredo community fridge in Laredo, Texas. There's a lot of heat and they have something that looks kind of like a Rubbermaid protective shelter. So if you find them on Instagram, you can probably see how they built that out. And maybe connect with Amy Schrader says that they've got a big Rubbermaid pantry next to their fridge. So maybe she could give you some tips. Um, Megan, we're going to let you comment and then we're going to get into Todd's comment, which is the biggest I think, issue that I want us to all talk about, which is hoarding and volunteer challenges. But Megan, why don't you yeah, no, I mean, most of what I was going to talk about has been covered. We have two fridges. One has a wooden structure. One does not. The one that does not have a shelter. Um, we've gone through three fridges at that spot at this point over from last summer into some of the challenges of the winter. So it, I know it's difficult to get the wood, but that it really has made a difference. We've been kept that second fridge going well over a year now, um, which has been great. And in terms of keeping an eye, I know it is definitely something of concern this summer. And so we just really work that into our volunteer check. So every time someone goes to clean the fridge, we use signal, we send photos and we send photos of the temperature and we're just something like, we're just constantly monitoring so that if there is an issue, we can act really quickly on it. Fantastic. But um, the shelter in our experience have been really helpful. Yeah, I think most people um, tend to build them. We use tarp. Caesar and Sarita had this great tarp thing where it worked really well, but I want to get into, cause this is, this is probably um, the issue where a lot of people just have been dealing with, and it's a sensitive topic, but it's people hoarding. How do you handle that? And then also um, throw, let's throw in there like volunteer challenges, like volunteers who might scream at people who they think are taking too much money. 
what's been your experience and how have you handled it? And just jump in anybody. I'll go just because I have a volunteer who screams at people when they take too much. So I was like, oh, I feel this very personally. So I guess like the one challenge, I mean, I, you know, I remember, you know, I didn't always know about mutual aid, obviously. And then I remember the first time I ever saw someone, you know, I had just filled the pantry when it was just a pantry, there was no fridge yet. And I saw someone come up with a rolling suitcase and take everything. And like, of course, my first thought was like, oh man, like, that sucks. Right. But, you know, I, it's something that I th th think about this like every single day and have conversations with this about people every single day where it's, you know, I, I luckily have never been in that position where I would need all of that or even any of it. So, you know, I always have to kind of ground myself and remember like, you know, I think a bunch of people here, even, even in this group have told me that like, you know, we have to remember everything that goes into the fridge as a gift. Um, and once you give a gift, it's out there in the world for that person to enjoy however they would like to, whether, you know, right now in our group, there's, there's people who are really upset that people might, might be selling stuff. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, maybe we're our only link to them getting any money at all. It's, it's a, it's a topic that we talk about in our group all the time. And I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, if you don't really, if you don't really believe this, like, you know, you don't have to be in our, you don't have to work with our fridge. You know what I mean? Like, this is, you know, we've all like, I also don't even know, like if someone wanted to monitor the fridge, how would they even do it? Like I personally have no interest or desire, like any desire or time to, to set up a monitoring, even if that was something that was okay, you know? So I don't know, someone else can say something I could talk about. Todd, this. Todd has his hand up physically. Yeah, yeah, no, I did, did want to jump in because it is a significant tension here. Um, and I, I just want to raise a question and then a possible solution here. So, so one of the things that is the question is agency is basically how much are we deciding what happens in the fridge and how much is the community deciding? You know, and, I, and it's an honest question. Um, if we polled community members and said, how do you feel about coming to the fridge? And this is extreme. I'm giving extreme such you know, question. How do you feel about coming to the fridge and you feel like it's always empty or it's often empty or you see a hoard around the fridge and, and when you get to it, nothing's there. And so how do you feel about that? Do you feel like that there should be some control on how much people can take? And again, I don't know what people would say, but we haven't really asked them. And, and I think that's a, a question about what would they say? And how much is it, should we as organizers um, be able to say, well, this is the, this is the culture and, and we're going to say, this is the culture and, and the community, how much agency do they have in that decision? And then the second thing is just as a practical suggestion, which is we've been trying to think about, well, not putting everything out at once, you know, putting if it's especially really good stuff like meat or nuts or things that are just very rare or high quality, um, maybe put out some and then a couple few hours later put out some more and as much as we can kind of space it out. But but it's it is a very, very tough question and we actually have no unity around this uh, here at the in Somerville, Massachusetts. So I just want to before we get to the hands that are raised, I just want to um, say that when we first started the fridge, I was one of the people who had an issue because it's like everybody should share. And it was Sarita's husband, Caesar, who was the one who said it's a gift. And then I was like, right. So for me, people who are trying to tell people how much to take, it's their control issue. They're trying to control what other people do. I don't think for me personally, I don't think I have the right to do that, that the fridge you put the food in, once the food is in, it's not your control, how much a person takes. And this is the other thing, and this has been so big in our group is there's like one person who causes a problem. There's one person saying people are stealing food, people are selling it on the street, people are it's only one or two. We always forget the 98% that are so grateful. And once that negativity starts, it rolls and builds and builds. So like Edie, Sarita and I, like we have to jump in and sort of remind people that this is a gift. Once you give it, you can't control it. Like it was my control issue that was upsetting 
me about who was taking food in the fridge, not the food being taken. But anyway, Erin, do you want to, oh, wait, you know, Erin, I'm sorry, Kaz had her hand up first. Kaz? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, okay. So I have a few things to say about this. Um, one is just to start, I found that, um, I, like I'm noticing as fridges, uh, are created in New York city, cause th there's a lot of them around here. Um, there's kind of a process. So first people are a little, I mean, especially in marginalized communities, people are a little suspicious. They're not really into it. Then when they notice that it's there, that's when the hoarding begins. But the thing is, like, like someone mentioned in the chat, it's a response to food insecurity, intense food insecurity. And the thing is, as they notice that the fridge is sticking around and as they notice that it's being taken care of and that it's not going anywhere, I've at least noticed that people are hoarding less um, because the hoarding happens because they're afraid that it's gonna go away. And so I, I just, over time, I've noticed that that it has become less of a problem in addition um, we, I mean, I, I've been blessed enough that like our fridge is located, uh, in front of a, a, a salon where the people there are engaged with the fridge. You know, I, I made it a concerted effort to, uh, introduce myself and, and, you know, offer them food whenever we fill it up and ask them what they wanted. And so I, I've also noticed that a kind of community policing is happening, um, not even something that like I asked for, but like, because they know the people who might be taking a, a lot going up baskets and stuff, they're able to talk to them personally as people who know them and people who have lived with them for a long time. Um, which kind of leads me to the point of, of um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how effective this is everywhere, but you know, when, when I'm filling it up and people are, grabbing over each other, I tell them this is here out of love and this is here because we want to help everyone in the community and we want to make sure that everyone gets food and, and sometimes that reaches through. Um, but uh, I, also, I also agree with the idea of putting some things away. We have like a, a couple of fridges have like a, a cabinet that has a lock on it that all the volunteers get the, the code for and we keep cleaning supplies there and we keep like um, we keep back stock basically. We fill it up and we put half there. Um, and although I will say that I, I help at a pantry in the Bronx and we noticed that there was a, a deli, like a, a, a store taking our stuff and reselling it. So we just started writing free on the gallons of milk and bottles. And I understand that that might not be something everyone agrees with, but that was something we did for, um, major reselling not like just some like one or two people trying to resell it like literally a, a store um taking it and reselling it yeah that was one um, of my suggestions for the people selling the other thing i've told people in our community is that you don't know like that person might need diabetes medication for their child like you just don't know why they might be selling it we need to come in with compassion and, and understand we don't we're not in their shoes Anyway, Kaz, are you are you done? I'm sorry. I sorry if I interrupted you. Okay, Erin, did you want to jump in? Yeah. So everything Cass just said was very relatable, um, and I wanted to say that we had uh, this issue when we first started. There was this one lady who was coming with her grocery bags and filling up her bags, and one of the hosts. Uh, was taking pictures of her and sending them to our main organizer and saying this lady comes every time the fridge is filled up she fills up her bags well we ended up doing a community event um, where we cooked some kind of plate lunches and gave them out to the people around the neighborhood that were walking by to kind of introduce them to the fridge um, within our first month of starting it and um she ended up being there. And so one of our uh, organizers talked to her for a while and uh, she feeds her children and her grandchildren from the fridge. They wake up some mornings and they say, you know, what are we going to eat today? And she says, let's go see what's at the fridge. So it's like they thought she was taking all of these things for herself. And I'm sure it made her feel uncomfortable that someone was taking pictures of her taking these items and it turns out she's 
feeding her entire family. So it, it all goes back to, we really don't know what they're doing, you know? So we try to, when we encounter an issue like that with someone reaching out to us about someone stealing, stealing or whatever it is, we will um, sometimes make a post about it. Or if someone is at the fridge policing it, we'll say, you know, you don't, we just have to kind of come in and I guess remind people that we don't really know what's going on you know right totally agree mike z do you want to jump in uh yes uh this topic is near and dear to my heart we've had some issues at our fridge uh with people quote unquote courting um and the concept of like policing is not something that we want to do at our fridge but if I've noticed, like, if you don't do any form of policing, the hoarding behaviors can lead to verbal and physical altercations between people. Um, at least at our fridge, we've seen that sort of escalation. So for us, the hard part is trying to find ways to police without policing, if that makes any sense. And like, if we get large donations, maybe space out when we put out all the food instead of putting it all out at once. Because what we what we get a lot of is we have 10 to 20 people who are regularly at our location, um, pretty much seven days a week. So when we do get food, when it, when it comes in, it's going to the same, for the most part, 15 to 20 people every day. And that has led to altercations with other community members, um so yeah it's been a, a challenge for us and have you come up with any solutions or how are you handling the altercations well one thing we try to implement is when we know we're getting large donations we try to spread out the food as much as possible we used to put everything out all at once and we noticed that it granted you know people have large families and they have a lot of people that they're trying to feed, but it's going to the same group of people. So we try to spread it out. That has helped uh, a little bit. Um, we try to increase the volume of food that we push through our fridge, thinking that maybe if we push more food through, the incidents wouldn't be occurring as often because there's more food, um, but that, has led to, I think, an increase, to be honest. The more food we push through, it, it seems like the more people we have waiting by the fridge mm. for food. And, uh, you know, when you have more people there, when food comes, I think the likelihood of an altercation is, is greater than if someone is just walking by and, and grabbing food. Agreed. Um, I was just going to say one thing we're trying to do, which um, we've been marginally successful with, is um, telling stories about the people who take the food. Because I think um, one of the things is that there are a lot of volunteers who, or, or just local community members, who put in the food in the fridge and walk away and don't know this, who's taking the food. And, and again, maybe if somebody's taking a lot of it, they get discouraged and, and angry possibly, but they, again, they don't know the story behind that person. So trying to post on social media when appropriate, when, you know, we have the guest permission, you know, what the story is and um, where the food is going. So I think in particular, our volunteers understand what all their hard work is doing. Yeah, I think that's really important is when people start to, to hear stories from people who are taking the food and how much it's helped them, it can help shift if you're going in a negative round, it can shift the ball back toward the positive. I'm um, Soleil, Soleil, I'm sorry, I'm horrible, I'm so bad. Yeah, no, fine, Soleil. So I think one of the things that people don't think about is that everyone has or can afford food. What we can't afford is rent, we can't afford utility bills, we can't afford transportation. So what happens is, is that our funds get funneled over to those things because it is harder to get help to pay for rent and utilities and for your train pass or whatever the case may be versus 
getting help for food. There are more resources out there for food. And I think that as mutual aid folks, as refrigerator, as uh, fridge keepers, it is our responsibility that if we're seeing a person or a family constantly visiting our fridges, it is our responsibility to connect those folks to care. And because obviously the fridge is just a band-aid, these people need long-term help. Um, if it's something that we can connect them to or to provide, then we should be doing that, not just saying, oh, we'll see you tomorrow. And how do you do that? Like, do you have so, somebody from social services? Because that's what I, one of my comments was, you know, we could call somebody from social services and have them at the fridge because I never felt qualified to talk about rent or, you know, there are people who have mental issues. People weren't able to get their medication during the pandemic. I'm not qualified to be able to really uh, approach them. And I don't want any of the volunteers to get, we had someone that got smacked with a cane. Like we don't want anyone to get hurt. So how do you, how do you handle that? Sure. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. So what, some of the things that you can do is in advance as a group with your volunteers and your organizers is put together a list of resources that you have vetted mm. that, talk, that, you know, keep your community safe, that aren't going to like work with ICE, that aren't going to work with the police department. And that's how you start to connect people to care. Just kind of being like, hey, here's a list of resources that you might be able to benefit from. If you need help, feel free to reach out to us. Let mm. Put the ball in their court to be like, Here's the help if you didn't know that it wasn't there. That's a great idea. Um, and just everyone, Ariana put a link to the resource page for this. Yeah, I just, there's a lot of stuff that we're working on. So I apologize because we move in all directions. So in South Bronx Mutual Aid, this is exactly what we're dealing with. It's the housing, it's the legal, it's the everything, right? The eviction moratorium just ended. So we're referring a lot of people to housing attorneys in the city, like Mobilization for Justice, like Met Council. Um, like uh, Council of Concerned Legal Professionals. Um, we're, just, we're taking up with different agencies to make sure that we can offer those referrals and you know, working with other invested groups, right? Your local, if there's an ICE watch or you know, sort of like a network of mutual aids so that this information gets put out. If you're not already in mutual aid, connecting with your local mutual aid is highly recommended because they can flyer your area. Um, same thing again with folks that work in immigrants' rights, immigrants' advocacy groups, or legal justice groups, like that's really powerful to have at your fridges. So I dropped a link to our resource page. If you want to shoot us an email, I'm happy to send you a copy. If you just want to put in your own info, it's applicable to anybody in New York City. Our info is applicable to anybody in New York City, but with a bit of a focus on the Bronx. But again, like we're happy to share steal it, make it your own. Uh, that's us. So, but definitely partner with, again, some type of groups, whether they're mutual aids or activist groups that will flyer your, you know, fridges with know your rights and who can you call for free legal care and who can you call if you're dealing with, you know, immigration or if you're dealing with some other issue that I didn't mention, but coming up, like we have folks that are trying to interview for jobs that don't have clothing. So, you know, we have clothing that we also distribute but that's another thing that like, man, if we know that that's what you're looking for, we can connect you back to that. Baby items are also huge. So just having ways that people can access us or other groups that have that stuff available to them can help defer some of the concerns around, especially um, housing security and legal security. So I think you just hit on something that's super, super important. I think that the future of fridges is that, because I've always said they're like a community center because people gather around and they would talk. You need a lot of people but I think they're going to turn into community resources because what you're doing in the South Bronx, like with all those resources, you're helping people with, if, if the, I didn't realize that the uh, rent moratorium ended, like when that stuff all ends, it's going to be more and more important. So I think that's a really great idea that fridges also consider having a list of resources for other health. Honestly, we think of it like a one-stop shop because think of it from this perspective. In the pandemic, how many places shut their doors? City agencies all went remote. So there was no place to go walk up to, to go and get information or resources. Um, the vast majority of CBOs shut their doors and they went all remote, except when you're dealing with vulnerable populations, that's not going to work. So many people are no longer able to pay their cell phone bills. Can I tell you as a teacher, how many families have had their cell phones be disconnected, right? Where they didn't have reliable internet service, or that's just not a thing that they could communicate, right? In best form when they're doing it virtually. So we've often found, look, if you have a place that people know they can physically go to 24 hours a day and go get some information on resources. And then once you connect, 
right? Then you can outreach. Like I have a high school volunteer that helps us that she does a lot of that back and forth. Whenever people reach out to our, to our Google voice, um, or we do respond to DMS on IG a lot. Like these are all these things that we've tried to make sure like the fridge is sort of, as Soleil was mentioning the tip of the iceberg, because really we're thinking about community care without gatekeeping. And we're thinking about advocacy as much as possible without gatekeeping, because we want people to be able to support themselves and survive ultimately, right? We don't want to be the only way that that happens. We can't, the fridge is empties. So, you know, we're, we're trying to think of multiple ways to, Hey, like here's a map on our research page, for example, to find the other fr fridges or other pantries or other options. Um, and maybe if you can secure your rent situation, or you know, at least that you have some degree of protection from eviction, then you're understanding what your other options might be financially. Right. So not a perfect solution, but we just find we kept our doors open when a lot of other places shuttered and we were responsive when a lot of other places weren't. So we've tried to make our fridges, the hubs for where you can get some of that information. Um, also maybe even like a scannable QR code for any cell phone might be helpful because that, you know, you just put your camera in front of it. Right. So food for thought and print papers. Thank you. And Soleil, thank you. The food is a right, not a privilege. I agree. I have a whole program. I believe everyone deserves food, healthy food at no cost. Anyway, that's what I'm trying to work on. But Mike Z, you have been very patient. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, add um, that we've been working with Project Bread. Um, we've been like handing out their flyers about SNAP and about other food resources. And uh, I don't remember who said this earlier, but when we first started working with them, I didn't really feel qualified to talk about their programs or explain how they work to our community members. So we reached out to them and they've been coming down to uh, the fridge uh, once a week when we host our weekly food drive and speaking with people directly about uh, SNAP and about other food resources in the area. They've been very helpful um, in regards to that. Um, but if some fridges, I don't know if they're national or if they're just local to mass, um, but they're a great resource to utilize as well. Fantastic. So we are one minute at time. Does anyone wanna give a closing thought, something? Um, what I will do is I will email you all. You all get the link to this so you can rewatch it if you want. Um, I'm hopefully going to see if I can save the chat and I will send that out. There's some great resources in there. Um, but does anyone please? Oh, Jenny, I see your hands up. Hop in. Hello. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. And we've been doing a great job. And I know that it's hard sometimes, but just to, to, to know that there's a group of people around you that support and we're here for you. Um, also at our fridge, we've been trying to install a little library. Um, we also have a bulletin board at our fridge. So it almost feels like we're an outdoor community resource. It's like Ariana had mentioned. Um, and I think that's something that's new for our community and other communities around the country is like not having, going to a place that is a judgment-free zone and having all these resources here for you. Um, and so that has been super helpful, I think, for our community members, especially since we in, we put up a QR code at our fridge so folks can drive by or walk by, just take it um, and then go about their day. Um, and Mike had mentioned that um, we've been working or they, Dorchester has been working with Project Bread and Rosendale. We're looking forward to working with Project Bread and they're, they've been really helpful. Um, so what we've been doing is really trying to connect our community members to other resources in the city. Um, and putting up maps um, around the neighborhood, like we'll go flyering uh, with other food resources that we, we know of. So I think that that the starting point is the community fridge and that we've been trying to expand it into other avenues with finding ways to connect our, our neighbors to more resources um, in the city. Fantastic. Anyone else? Come on, East Village. No, okay, well, listen, um, I, I see the save button. There's really great info in the chat if you guys weren't looking in the chat. Uh, thank you guys so much. There was a suggestion we do this regularly. So when I email you all, I'll sort of gauge if you guys wanna you know, check back in once a month, if you wanna do, uh, do we need another Slack or Facebook group? I don't know, but let's see what everyone thinks. Okay, so thank you all. And um, hopefully I'll see you all soon. Bye.
Thank you. Bye. So bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.